can I invite you to take your seats, please? And uh, please remember to keep your distance from one another. That would be great. Good morning. A bright, sunny, happy morning to you all. And a welcome to uh, from, uh, St. Julian's Baptist Church. Very nice to see you all. Right, I have some rules to go through. But not before. I'd like to read from uh, a psalm, if that's okay. I'm a bit echoey here. I don't know why. I'm going to stand over here instead. Let's see. Sorry, I should have looked this up beforehand, really, shouldn't I? I'm going to read from Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Saviour. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. This is our God. Amen. So, so, some rules for you today. So please um, adhere to the one-way system. As you come in those doors today, you come into the church through that door. If you need to leave, um, we can go out through this door and out the back. If you need to go to the toilet, please just one uh, person in the toilet at a time. So you might need to wait outside. Any children who need the toilet, could they be accompanied by an adult? That would be great. As we leave today, if this half of the church could go out of this door, and down the corridor and out and away. And this half of the church out of this door and out that way, that would be great. Um, I know it's rainy, but please escape away from the door because people will be coming behind you. And I'll be strict on you again today. When the service is finished, you need to leave. And I mean it, you need to leave. So uh, I'll be uh, pestering you to leave. So please make your way away from the doors uh, and outside. I hope you brought a brolly. If you do want to hang around and chat to people outside, feel free to do so. Um, you can either get wet hair or, you know, use a brolly, that's fine. Uh, just a reminder of the two-metre kind of rule as well. I've seen lots of people this morning already um, walking straight up to people and having a normal conversation as if it's normal, and it's not. You know, it's not okay. You need to keep your distance from one another if you're not in that household, please. Um, so please uh, consider that. I think wearing a mask sometimes gives us a false sense of security. So um, just a reminder of that. Um, there will be three songs today. We won't be singing them, so please don't sing. Um, and let's see. I think that's just about all the rules. Have I missed anything? Oh, that's okay. I think we're okay to carry on then. Lovely. So... Before anything else, sorry? There's a prayer meeting on Tuesday. Are there any other notices? There's a prayer meeting Tuesday. What time? Seven o'clock. Lovely. Any other notices? No? <laughs> yeah, Peter is a fair weather jam seller. Um, but he said that he was also thinking of you being fair weather jam purchasers. You know, so, um, yeah, if you want jam, you'll just have to keep coming until... If it stops raining by next week, I will bring it next week. Lovely. Okay. Um, and I understand today's a very special day for a very special lady. Okay, so... Oh, it's not that special. Oh. <laughs> You're not supposed to say that. <laughs> 
but do you know what? I'm, I'm so happy. We're all spared because on a, on a normal kind of uh, day, if, if this virus wasn't the case, then we would have to hear Ula sing. And today we're, we're spared this. So uh, we will not be singing. But I wonder, Pete, would you play Happy Birthday? Oh, it's Hattie's as well. So it's for Helen and Hattie. So you'll just have to imagine in your head or say the words Helen and Hattie when it gets to the name bit of Happy Birthday. How's that? We'll just say it. <laughs> Helen, Hattie. <laughs> oh, very nice. <laughs> Lovely. So, yes, happy birthday. Have a wonderful day. Gonna be sunbathing? <laughs> okay, lovely. Well, shall we just pray and then uh, we're going to have a song on the screen. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you, this is a day that you have made. Help us, Father, as we come together to celebrate this day, to celebrate your love for us, to remember the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. To remember the price that was paid and remember how free we are because of the love that you've poured out on us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So our first song has lots of actions. And I know I practiced this yesterday with Olivia. She's not going to come up the front, but she's just going to stay over there. But Olivia knows the actions. I believe it's going to be on the screen as well. I wonder if I'm going to be able to see this, any kind of screen while this happens as well. It's a song called One Way. So James, could we have that up on the screen? <laughs> Lovely. And most of the actions involve this. So we can all be involved in that, okay? Think of it as aerobics. So let's get involved. Live by faith and not by sight for you. 
Wonderful. It's really funny watching you all sitting down, waving your arms around, not singing. Um, I'm going to welcome up Aidan and Ula. They have a talk for us this morning. Wonderful. Aidan, you look really smart. Excellent. Aidan's going first, so we'll just... We'll find out which animal he's talking about today in a moment. Many penguins will mate the same number of the opposite sex season after season. How faithful are we to our God? Penguins, parents, both male and female, care for the lung for seven months until the chicks are strong enough to hunt for food. On our own, we have a God who cares for us. Despite their lack of physical ears, penguins are excellent at hearing and rely on distant, distant calls to identify their mates. How good are we hearing what God? Has to say to us. One of the biggest ways that penguins protect themselves is by living in large groups. They are less likely to be attacked. But there are a lot of penguins around. And not always helps because there are so many of them. We keep a lookout. We support each other through our churches. And what have you got to show? And I think he's got quite a lot to show this time. Hold them up really high, Aidan. But that's not the end, is it, Aidan? This is going to be a bit like Cracker Jack, I think, you know, where they had double or drop in the old days if you're as old as me or Helen. Should we hold them up? And some more. And you've got more, haven't you? This one's... This is a good one. This is a Newcastle United one with all the little stripes there. I can say that because they won yesterday. So thank you. Aidan. And now it's my turn. Thank you, Aidan. 
Uh, yeah. Aidan and I like to do these little talks together because when you think about animals, very often when you think about what an animal's like, there are things that really challenge us and make us think about what we're like and what God's like to us. But why penguins today? Well, we shouldn't have been here today. We should have been out in the Cotswolds, a nice little house there. And this afternoon, Helen was going to feed the penguins at Birdland in Borton on the water. But we weren't allowed to go. We can't leave Newport. Mind you, perhaps that's for the better today because we are going to be able to do it again when things do change. But Aidan was telling you about penguins. You know, the, quite a few facts, you know, they always have the same other half. You know, they keep really faithful to whoever their other half is. I wonder how faithful we are to God. You know, do other things get in the way that we like doing? Or is God always first with us? Penguins look after their young. You know, they really never leave them over those first few months. It's hard for us at the moment, isn't it? But however hard it is, and if we are feeling things are difficult... God never leaves us, so God's always there with us. They've got really good hearing uh, because, you know, if they need a mate, you know, they're not with that mate off-season, so they have to have a special call, and they can hear that mate, that other penguin from a long, long way away. How hard do we listen to what God says to us? Are we ready to listen, or do we get bound up with other things? Last of all, you never see a penguin on their own, do you? Have you seen films like Happy Feet? And they're all together, or you see David Attenborough's thing. They're all together in a big, big bunch because they look after each other, because they care for each other. We're really lucky because we're together in a fellowship. And you know, we can't do it on our own, but by being together as we are in our fellowship, you know, we can look after each other and we can take care of each other and we can flourish together. So when you think about penguins, think about God and think about us and our relationship together. Well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So you're going to watch another music video now. It's quite a, I really like this one. It's called So Will I. Um, it's quite a long video and it's quite inspirational. Um, I find. So we're going to watch that, and that's going to help lead us into prayer. Um, so uh, I'll just share something after the video, and then hand over to Sean for our prayer. <laughs> God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time. With no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born in the vapor of your breath. The planets form, and if the stars were made to worship, so light, I can see. Once 
you have spoken on nature and science follow the sound of your You speak a hundred billion creatures catch your breath evolving in pursuit of what you said and if it all reveals your nature so alive I can see down my heart through all of my failure and pride on a hill you created the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die and as you speak a hundred billion fairies disappear Well, you lost your life so I could find it here and If you left the grave behind you so alive I can see your heart in everything you've done Every part designed in a work of art called love If you clearly chose surrender, so will I I can see your heart a billion different ways Every precious one, a child you died to You gave your life to love them so alive Like you would again a hundred billion times But what magic could amount to your desire You're the one who never leaves the one behind before Sean comes to pray. I prepared a sort of a collection of thoughts 
could be seen as a poem, but it's heavily inspired by the Psalms. Um, so I'd just like to share that with you. In the turmoil around us, we look to you, our God, for comfort. The fear of disease is in the air that we breathe and in the spaces we live. We take for granted as we come and as we go that the depth of your love doesn't know an end. You're our shield, a protector, and as we stand together, we find joy in our sharing. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. How majestic is your name in all the earth. I consider your work, the stars, moon, and sun. I accept them as part of your plan, but can't understand why you are mindful of man. It was the breath of your mouth that made all this come about, and I lie down and wonder at it all. I'll praise you and be glad in the morning. I will work in the day and remember your goodness in the evening. I will wonder in awe at night and say, great is the Lord. In the winter, my feet will not slip or stumble. In the spring, you command new life. In the summer, I will run the race and finish strong. And in the autumn, you will wash the land clean. If we cannot sing together, then I will shout your praise. I will boast about you. As the deer pants for the flowing water, my soul will long for you. And I know goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Let's all come to our Lord in prayer. I'm just going to read from Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Yet let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present, present your request to God. And the peace of God, will, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of being able to come into your holy place. Lord, we think of the sacraments on the table that's allowed us to come into the very throne room of God because of your sacrifice. To bring these prayers to you. You hear each prayer. Lord, we, not, we pray for all our churches and Christians throughout this world that are praising you today. We might not be able to sing your praises, but you see our hearts, and even the stones cry out to you as we bring our praise to you. You see in our hearts that they are praising you and just sending your worship to you because of what you've done for us that has given us a hope and a future. Well, Heavenly Father, we want to give you all the praise and all the honor that is due your name. And Lord, I pray for all those that are suffering with COVID-19. We pray for President Trump at this moment and for all those that are struggling. We ask your healing and we ask your blessing. We pray for all those that are still struggling with the effects of COVID-19. We think of Denise and all those who are, are all the after effects. We ask your healing. We ask that you will set them free from this, Lord, and that you will return them to full health. And we ask this in Jesus' name. I also pray for healing for Louis and for Wendy's daughter Naomi. We claim a mighty healing and a miracle of healing in Jesus' name, that they will be completely set free of this disease and you will just set them back and, Lord, bring them back to full health. And again, I ask this in Jesus' name. And Heavenly Father, I'm going to leave a space that for anyone to bring their prayers and their requests to you. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen.
Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come before your feet. And we thank you for the tool of prayer, which is the powerhouse of our faith. Help us to remember to sit before you each day. Thank you, Lord, that you cover us with your wings. Thank you that you've kept us all safe and you've brought us back into your house. Lord, we pray for all those that are worshipping you, that physically or virtually. But Lord, we just want to thank you for the love that was poured out on the cross. We just want to say we love you, Jesus, and we thank you. And we look forward to the day when you come and take us to be with you. So bless this day and everyone in this place. And Lord, may we go out different to what we've come in, because we've all met with you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's my opportunity to to greet you as well. And uh, we have a lovely uh, morning ahead of us. Uh, It's been great already. Uh, Thank you, Aidan and uh, and Ola, for that children's talk, and Harvey for for those words of those meditations. It's just been beautiful. And I really sense that there's been a real sort of a unity, a oneness, and and I'm quite sure that you didn't sit down and plan that spontaneity or, you know, that, 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 that oneness, that theme. That's, a, that's the Holy Spirit. That's what he does. He, puts some, he drops something on one person's heart, and he drops some, one thing on another person's heart and another person's heart, and it all comes together, and, and it's all of a sudden we're saying the same thing. And that's, a, that's miraculous. That's supernatural. That's, that's a beautiful thing. And that's God all over. Well, uh, we are now uh, to receive some people into, uh, into fellowship, and I just a, a word to say that when we say that um, some people are going to become members of our church, um, it doesn't mean that, um, that you were never members of Christ's body beforehand or that you're not seen as that. It, it means uh, that it's an opportunity for us as a church to stand up and say, you know, we're going to take care of you, we're going to look after you, we're going to walk with you and watch over you. And, um, and, the, and, and you with us as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a statement of, of, of commitment, of love from the fellowship to you and you to the fellowship. We are now to receive uh, Gareth. So if you could come forward, Gareth. And Steph would have been uh, coming into membership too, or she, or she is rather. And I'm going to take kind of an executive decision. Is this all right? That on, be, on behalf of Steph, Gareth will stand in. Is that all right? Rather than have a separate for, for Steph, because so, so Steph had a had an accident, didn't she? She did. Yeah, got the radiator on her foot. So. Now you, you can't say that every day, can you? Uh, that's not something. <laughs> if so, you can. But Lynn can. So she's she's got the radiator on her foot, and um, and she's incapacitated at the moment. All right. So on behalf of Steph as well, you can yeah. stand in in in. Uh, what do they say uh, in, in uh... there we go, local parameter. There we are, that's what I was looking for. <laughs> and uh, can I also have Jeanette? If you, Jeanette, you could come. You've got to stand socially distanced, though. That's the, that's the only thing. There we are. And uh, Ronnie? If you want to, yeah, that's right, you can stand this side. Let me push these chairs under there, it's easier for me then. And Dan and Josie. And bring the little ones as well. If they, unless they want to stay where they are at. <laughs> Lovely. If you want to stand on this side all together. Okay, so we are going to receive uh, these uh, members of Christ's body, Gareth and Steph, Jeanette and Ronnie and uh, Dan and Sophie, into the membership of St. Julian's Baptist Church. And we enter into a covenant with them to share with each other in the building up in the church to the glory of God, working alongside one another in his service in the world 
and encouraging one another in the love of God. And so I'm going to ask a question, and it's a little bit like getting married. So I'm going to ask a question, you say, I do, or I will, okay? So, I'll, 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 Dan, uh, Dan and Sophie and Ronnie and Gareth and Jeanette and Steph, uh, do you declare your faith in the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and having found new life in him? And do you believe that God has called you to serve Christ as part of this local Baptist church? Do you commit yourself to love and to serve the Lord within this church, community, and in the world, and be filled with the Holy Spirit to fulfill your ministry in the body of Christ? Could the members of St. Julian's Baptist, could you just stand just where you are? And again, it's a simple, I do, and we will. Do you welcome St. Julian's Baptist Church? Do you welcome Gareth and Jeanette, Dan, Sophie, and uh, Ronnie, and Steph <laughs> into the family of God in this local Baptist Church? And do you promise to love encourage, strengthen, guide, and pray for, and care for them as an equal partner in the body of Christ. Okay, you can be seated now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and on behalf of this fellowship, I welcome you into our membership here. Now, biblically, uh, it's a precedent that the Lord has, uh, has set for us in the New Testament, in the Scriptures. The right hand in, um, in the culture of the day. And, uh, and also, there's no reason to believe that the Lord has, um, has changed his mind on this. But the right hand is a hand of blessing. It's a hand that touches, that blesses and encourages and strengthens. And so, uh, in the New Testament, we hear of new members being brought into the membership of, a, of, of the church with the right hand of fellowship. But things being as they are, um, and not everybody um, feels as comfortable as other people about touching and these things and, and whatnot. So we're not going to do that today. And I, I'm not happy about that, I have to say. Um, it's not normal. But, um, but I would um, give you the hand of fellowship normally, and perhaps at an, another time we can have a big crutch, you know, because that's just as sacred, right? So I just want to pray for you now. O oh Lord, our God, you have joined us together in Christ, and from each to the other, you will speak your word of comfort and challenge. Make us ready to listen and swift to act, both church and new members. And may they not fail you, and nor we fail them. Lord God, we praise you for the ways that you guide our lives and give a sense of purpose to them. And thank you for all the direction and purpose that you have given in the lives of your children here this morning. We are grateful that in this church they have found a home. We pray that the sense of your direction and purpose may not leave them, but may grow and mature and bear fruit in their lives and in the life of the church. Send your blessing upon our life together through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. So you can sit down now. Give a come on, have a round. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus says, come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. We come to this table, and as we come, we take the opportunity to uh, acknowledge and understand what it is that we are about to share in. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread and he would have broken it and prayed a prayer, a prayer of a blessing over it. Say, so, blessed are you, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth, seed for the sower and bread for the eater. And he says, this represents, this is my body given for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. Think about me. Think about what I will endure for you. Think about what I have done for you. Think about my body bearing the weight of your sin, the weight of all your mistakes, all the shame, and all the guilt that has dragged you down. Think of me taken it all away on the cross where I will die for you. That was the gravity. But the disciples wouldn't have grasped straight away, although Jesus had told them often enough that the Son of Man will be handed over to, to evil men and he will, be, he will suffer, he'll be beaten, he'll be mocked, and they'll put him to death. But on the third day, he will rise again. But whether out of uh, just willful... Um, um, ignorance, deciding not to, to, to take on board that awful truth, what would have sounded like an awful truth for them, they, um, they put it to the, backs of their mind, the back of their mind. But Jesus is reminding them again, this is going to happen, but it's for you. And you've got to remember, when you see me there on that cross, I did it for you. And in the same way, he took the cup also. He would have took a goblet, something similar to that, perhaps. It's very convenient that it's there. I don't think it was there last time. But thank you for whoever placed it there. And he would have held it up. And he would have said, this cup represents the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink from this one cup, and you will proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Now he would have passed the cup around and all of the, the, the disciples together would have drunk out of it, the same cup. But we can't do that for obvious reasons. But we're going to drink together today and remember that the blood of Christ, the blood of the Son of the living God was shed for you. And if you had been the only person, it sounds like a cliche, it is a cliche, only because it's true. If you had been the only person alive on the earth that day, Jesus would have shed his blood for you. He would have gone to the cross for you. And he would have said, do this and remember me. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God and Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord God, for demonstrating your great love for us in this. That while we were still sinners, while we were still in our sins, unable to do anything about the awful predicament that we found ourselves in, weak and without any ability to put ourselves right in your sight. You sent your son into this world, born under the law, to redeem us who are under the weight of that law. We thank you, Father God, for the, sh for the body of Christ that you allowed to be broken and beaten for us and his life to be taken away. We thank you, Lord, for the blood of your son 
that you allowed to be spilled so that our sins could be forgiven. Help us, Lord, as we take communion, as we eat the bread and drink the cup today. Help us, Lord, to see ourselves as those who are forgiven, as those who are redeemed, as those who have been bought with a price that no one else and nothing else could pay. Help us realize just how powerful an impact on our lives and on this world that one act has had. So God, we pray. Help us to examine ourselves. Help us not to eat and drink just flippantly like it doesn't matter. But Lord, when we take that bread and we swallow it, may we know that it's like taking you into our lives by faith, trusting you, saying, Lord, I depend on you as much as I depend on bread to live. And as we drink that cup, may we know that every sin that we've ever committed and ever will commit, has found its solution, its remedy, its forgiveness in you. Who is going to help me to serve communion this morning, Sean? When you receive the bread, just eat it straight away. And when you've received the cup, just hold on to that because we're going to drink that together. It's a little bit like drinking from the same cup. It's symbolic. It's powerful. And we're going to drink together and say that, that we are one in Christ.
We you share the loaf, our one body, and we you drink the cup, our one in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, your death, O oh Lord, we commemorate. But your resurrection, we confess. Final coming, we await. Lord God, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace, and open the gate of glory that we may come in. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life today. May we who drink his cup bring life to others. May we who are filled with the Holy Spirit give light and love to all the world. Keep us firm in the hope that you have set before us so that we and all your children shall be free indeed and the whole earth live to the praise of your name, through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. I just want to begin by, um, by reading a psalm, Psalm 84, so if you have it in the Bible, in your Bible with you, or maybe James, if we, if, if we can maybe get it on the screen, if that's, uh, if that's doable, Psalm 84. And I've got a confession to make as well, and I didn't need to tell her this, you'd have been none the wiser, but I didn't plan on that picture up there. I did have a PowerPoint, <laughs> but for some reason, uh, it doesn't seem to be saving technical problems, saving to my computer and to the memory stick, so we're not able to show it, but, uh, but um, that'll do, because that's what I want to talk about today, is, uh, is following Jesus, becoming a disciple, and living the life of a disciple, and where it really all begins. How are we doing with that um, reader? Just cool. Brilliant. Okay, Psalm 84, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar. O Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, another word for weeping and mourning, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength, till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, O Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, O God of Jacob. Look upon our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield, the Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. O Lord Almighty, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Do you remember how um, I, I quoted, I've quoted for a couple of weeks running now, that quote by A.J. Gordon, and he says, The look saves, but the gaze sanctifies. The look saves, but the gaze sanctifies sanctifies. In other words, a look can be just a quick glance, but a gaze is something that lingers. 
A gaze is something we do when we want to take, take it in a view, a sight. To, as the, the old English biblical word is behold it, to see it, to take it all in and let it wash over you. But to do that takes time and it takes, it takes a decision to drop out of the rush and take the opportunity just to be still and gaze. We look to Jesus to be saved. We look to him. He says that if anyone believes in me, he's crossed over from death to life. Believing in Jesus is all it takes. But we walk with Jesus in order to grow, to become mature. And that will last a lifetime. It's like the difference between being a companion and an acquaintance. A companion shares the journey. We've talked about that a little bit, haven't we, already? We've, that idea of walking with one another and watching over one another. Companionship is different to being an acquaintance. An acquaintance is somebody we see now and again. We rub shoulders with now and again. There's a difference also in being acquainted with someone and being a follower of someone. The being a follower is, is a commitment. Being a follower is a, a, a decision that we have to make. Spiritual growth and maturity doesn't necessarily come with time. It's about the quality of our relationship, not just with Christ, but our relationship to Christ. How, qualitative is your relationship to Christ? In what capacity do you know him? It's a question that we have to ask ourselves. Time and time again, we should never uh, be flippant or complacent about these things because the Lord is looking for companions on the journey, not acquaintances, not those who give a, a quick glance and then look away to something else, but those who give themselves to gaze in, to walk in with the Lord Jesus. Somebody once said, and I love this quote, and I'm not sure who said it, but they said, spiritual maturity is not a matter of chronology, but of proximity. It's not a matter of chronology, time, but of proximity, closeness. What relationship to Christ is my relationship to Christ? How do I relate to Jesus? Am I a passing acquaintance at Christmas or Easter or now and again when the going gets tough, which is fine, but the Lord is always encouraging us for more. He's always seeking more from us. It was a saying uh, during um, Jesus' day, speaking of the relationship between a rabbi and his disciple, that just as one candle lights another, only if it is brought close, so a rabbi only teaches well when he, is in, when he is close to his disciple. So it's about closeness. It's about intimacy. I've, I've got a friend down in Devon, uh, my friend Andrew, and, um, and he, said, um, he says intimacy. So you could almost break that word down. Um, intimacy. Into me, you see. Into me, you see. See, intimacy means the knowing of a person. And knowing of the other. And the Lord knows us intimately. He sees us. He sees the real us. He sees the real you. But also, there's a, there's a responsibility. There's a, a privilege that is, that is ours as well. That we can know him intimately as well. I think it was, it was Paul the Apostle who said, um, who said that, that his spirit in us it, it, it cries, Abba, Father. 
It's the spirit of adoption. It's the spirit that has been brought in, that has been brought near. And we cry, Abba, Father, we're to know him intimately. Do we want to be acquaintances or do we long to know him intimately, to be disciples? Because that's what it means to be a disciple. Matthew's gospel is written, and I'm going to read from Matthew in just a moment. Matthew's gospel is written to those who are desperate to see the messianic kingdom come breaking through into the world. And that term messianic kingdom is a, is a Jewish term. It takes us back into the day, even, well, even today, it would be the same. But I think with, if you think of the day when Jesus came riding into Jerusalem on that donkey, up to the beautiful gate of the city, and the people were there waving their palm branches and shouting, Hoshiana, Hoshiana, meaning, Lord, come save us. It means they were acknowledging Jesus as the Messiah. They were acknowledging him as a worldly, earthly Messiah who would come and destroy Israel's enemies and set Israel free so that they could be the nation and the God that they always wanted to be and they always intended to be. They were a little bit premature with that, with that though. That will happen one day in the way that they were expecting, in the way that they want but there are some things that had to happen first. This Messiah would come first as the suffering Messiah. One day he'll come as the triumphant, victorious, glorious Messiah. But first he came to suffer. He came to give his life as a ransom for many. These people were desperate. They were desperate to see that messianic kingdom come. It's Matthew's writing his gospel to, the, to a Jewish readership, a Jewish audience. Matthew himself, his name was Levi. He was a, um, why they had to change his name, I don't know. But, but he was a Jew himself. So he was interested in bringing the good news to his own people. To say, to say this is the one that we are to follow. This is the one that we are to worship. This is the one that we have been waiting for. And his whole letter is geared that way geared to those who don't see themselves as citizens of this world, but people who are of a new society called the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. But it doesn't sound, when you think of it, it doesn't sound too different from us either, does it? Matthew could have written this letter to us today as well because we are those kinds of people too. We are the ones that are desperate to see the Messiah come. We are the ones who are desperate to see his kingdom come breaking through into this world. And justice being done. And good prevailing over evil. We are those people who are called to be part of a new society. We are those who are citizens of a higher plane, a higher kingdom called the kingdom of God. A lot of people are interested. A lot of people were interested in Jesus' day. They would rally around. They would run around all over the place, following him wherever he was going. Crowds, multitudes, the scriptures say. And one day Jesus looks around and he sees how popular he's become. He realizes he's got a lot of fans out there. He's got a lot of people who are interested. And I want to read now uh, from the Beatitudes in Matthew Chapter 5, uh, verses 1, and I'll go to 12, though I'm not preaching on it all today. Matthew 5, chapter 1 to 12. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, 
for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. When he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountain, and after he sat down, he began to teach them. He began to teach them. It was when he saw the crowds that Jesus seems to do something unusual. Now, it depends on how you look at this. There's a different interpretation. Some scholars and theologians take a different slant on it. But I've seen it as something unusual. Rather than embrace the crowds, rather than revel in his fame and his, uh, and his, his new fandom, he withdraws, he leaves the crowds, he climbs up a mountainside, and there he sits down. See, not everybody was there for Jesus. They might have thought they were. But what they were really there for were what Jesus could what Jesus could do for them. You see, there's a difference in wanting to somebody for who they are and wanting somebody because of what they can do for you. But Jesus has done a lot for us. But it's who he is that makes that so special, That's so amazing. Do you want to know Jesus this morning intimately and personally? Because you can. He's made every way possible. He's opened the door. He's opened the life gate that all may go in, as the song says. Not everyone was there for Jesus, and it's the same today. The church has made a big business and a lot of money out of what God can do for you, about having your best life now about God wants you rich, God wants you healthy and wealthy, and I'm sure he does in many respects. But that is not what it is all about. For many ministries um, in this country and in, uh, and in uh, the, the great country of America, you know, ministries upon ministry are built on this prosperity gospel. This God wants you rich. It's all about you. The focus is off Christ, and it becomes all about what I can get from Christ and live the good life. So maybe Jesus has withdrawn himself from this crowd because he knows what's in a man, doesn't he? He knows the heart of man. He doesn't need for anyone to tell him what's in a man. He already knows. So he doesn't entrust himself to the crowds because the crowds are fickle. The crowds are all over the place. So maybe Jesus is saying in his heart, maybe his, re his reason for this is to see, let's see who's really committed to my cause. Let's see who's really committed here. Who are my disciples? He knows those he's called, but he'd opened the door for everyone. Everyone could have ascended that mountain if they want to, but only a few did. Oh, everyone could have followed Jesus up and sat at his feet, but only a few did. Jesus ascends the mountain and he sat down. He assumed the position of a, a, a Jewish rabbi. Wherever a rabbi would begin to preach, they would, they, they would sit down first. That's where they would how they would teach. It was a position of authority these days. It's what I'm doing. It's standing up, isn't it? You stand up to speak. And yet in Jewish culture, it still is. You sit down. And that's with your, and that's a, 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 it denotes authority. It denotes stature. And status, this is the teacher because he sat down in order to teach the people. Kings sat down to, de to uh, declare and to give decrees. Pilate, it was, an, it was an ominous thing when Pilate sat down on the judgment seat to pass his judgment on Jesus. He sat down in order to do it. 
But even more than that, the word rabbi means my master. It means my teacher, my master, my Lord. And even more than that, who else do we know went up a mountain? Who have we been looking at recently? You can shout it out. Let's be interactive. Who else went up a mountain to fetch Moses? Went up on a mountainside. So what's Matthew wanted to say about Jesus? Well, maybe in Deuteronomy 18, verses 22 to 23, we'll realize what Matthew was trying to say. It's when Moses tells the people of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. And you must listen to everything he tells you. And everyone who does not listen to that prophet will be completely cut off from the people. So what's Matthew saying? He's saying, this is the one. This is the one. Sorry, again, Matrix is coming back into my mind again. You've got to watch that film now. You'll know where I'm on about if you haven't seen it already. Do you remember I've talked about this character called Neo? Well, he's also the Messiah figure in this film. And he's called, also known as the one. He's the one. This is the one, Matthew was saying. Those with eyes to see it recognize Jesus as the one, the Messiah, the anointed one, the one that was specifically chosen by God the Father and set apart, anointed to be the savior of all people and to be the king of all, the king of the world, the king of the universe. But Jesus is waiting for those who just want him. He's withdrawn. In order, in a way, a little bit like when you hide from your kids. You play in hide and seek, and you don't hide too far, but you go far enough away, and they come follow you. They come to find you. It's such a beautiful thing, isn't it? Well, picture the scene. Jesus withdraws from the crowd, and he sits down, and his disciples, the ones who are committed, see it. And they leave the, the crowd. They leave the madding crowd, and they, they withdraw to be with Jesus. And he then, he begins, he begins to teach them. Jesus is waiting for those who just want him, for those who are just in awe and in wonder of him and who he is, those who come to him out of sheer delight, not because they have to, but because they want to. They love him. They can't get enough of him. They got to be where he is. They're so grateful. And that's my first point. That's the first point, I believe, of this. Do you realize we're only preaching from, from two verses this morning? Yet there's so much in here. There's so much. It's amazing. It's like uh, my friend used, in, in Mount Pleasant Baptist Church uh, used to say, um, yeah, God's word is like, a, it's like a piece of rich fruitcake. Every slice is full of something different. A disciple is one who is eternally grateful, eternally grateful. The disciples were grateful that they had had the privilege of knowing Jesus. They didn't take that privilege for granted. They were grateful that they were personally chosen by Jesus. One of my favorite passages in the scriptures is in the New Testament is John chapter 15 where Jesus is speaking about the vine and the branches. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener and he lifts up every branch in me that bears no fruit while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful and you are already pruned clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. And he goes on uh, to talk in the same way, teaching on the, on the importance of being near and abiding in Christ. Uh, but then he says this, and this is a word that was given to me when, um, um, when I, I realized I was first called to, to preach by a chap, um, wonderful man of God called John James Penarth Tabernacle. Anybody know John James? Wow, what a man. Honestly, wow. I love him. A little, sto little story, I'm going off, off track, right? I'm going off piste, right? But, um, so when I was in Mount Pleasant, 
Baptist Church. I hadn't been a Christian all that long, me and Michelle. And um, Michelle was at home, because uh, in that days, th- them days we used to fight over who was going to go to the service, because we were that desperate, that passionate. We couldn't wait. Who wants to go to, to you know, I wanted, wanted to go to church, she wanted to go to church, she, I wanted the other word, and she wanted the other word. So we used to take it in turns. Oh, it was like torture every week. So you all used to go in the morning, take the kids like we do, but in the evening, there wasn't any kids' work or anything usually, so it was only one of us, really, that, uh, that, that managed to go. And um, we were always fighting about that, shall we? <laughs> well, I went this one evening. It was my turn, I think. No, it wasn't my turn. Okay. So I, I, I managed to, um, to um, muscle my way in, and I went to church that evening, but only because I had this desperate feeling like I needed to go. I always had that anyway, don't get me wrong, because I just love to be in, with, with Christians were and worship with, with God's people. But I just, it was like a magnet in my belly. I just, I, if I didn't go, I was going to burst. Uh, the bricks of the eggs would have come with me as well. You know, I, I, so I went to church. I, whoop, I went to church that evening. And um, John James had been there all day, um, Reverend uh, Dr. John James. And um, it was Mount Pleasant's um, anniversary pretty sure. Anna Ruth was there. Well, you would have been at that, this time. I don't know whether you were in that exact service. Do you remember when John James came and it was Mount Pleasant? I think it was 200th anniversary, something like that. So uh, he was there to, to introduce to us Royston Evans, who was my pastor there, and um, I, I introduced, just help us get to know him a little bit more, because he'd known him for something like 30 years plus. And, um, and so that was really good. Well, in the evening, um, and he was preaching, John James was preaching on Psalm 110. And he used the verse, and he preached on the verse, your troops shall be willing on your day of battle. Your troops shall be willing on your day of battle. And he focused on that. He talked about our willingness to serve Christ, to be there, to go where he goes and go where he sends us to go. And my heart was just on fire. I was burning up on the inside. I'm not kidding. I'd never felt nothing like it. As he, it, was like, it was like his words were set alight, and there was a flame coming into my, into my, into my spirit. I was just alight. And um, so during the worship and the, and the praise as, as well that, 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 that um, came after that, you know, I was just, I, I, I was just alive. I was filled with the Holy Spirit. I really was. And I think John must have obviously seen that, seen this exuberant young lad, you know, um, there because I was on the edge of my seat for, for all of that service. And after that, John, had, he, he, he did something that's unusual, usually, for, for, most, for, that, for Mount Pleasant, anyway, to have an altar call for people to come forward and to, to be prayed for. And, uh, and he would be giving words of knowledge. It's a gift from, of the Holy Spirit. Words of knowledge, of prophecy to people as he prayed for them. And, um, and I was so shy, painfully shy. But you wouldn't know that, but I am. Okay, it's still, it's, anyway, another story, then, another sermon again, right? But, you know, I wasn't, I couldn't go. I wanted all my heart, but my body, my flesh, my mind was like, stay put, stay where you are, don't make an exhibition of yourself, you know? And, um, and he was coming to the end of this prayer time. The time was going on and on and on, and I was thinking, oh, I'm not going to get, I really want to be prayed for. Again, that magnet in my belly was drawing me. And I, in, the, in the end, I just went forward, and I sat on the front pew, and, um, and he was just going to wrap things up, and that's when I plonked myself down in front of him. And so the music kept playing, um, and, uh, and, and John came and sat next to me, and, uh, and he said, he asked me a question, to cut a long story short, he asked me a question, he said, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a postman. He said, oh, I was a postman once. So we, that got the conversation going, and, he, and I, he, I said... Um, and he said, what can I do for you? What can we pray about? And I said, I'm tired of just doing nothing. I really feel like, like God wants me to do something, but I don't know what it is. But I had no inkling about, you know, going into the ministry or preaching or anything verbal like that. You know, I, I didn't know what it was, but I knew there was something. I said, I'm, and my friend was, I'm, sit, I, I'm, I'm tired of like, sitting on my hands or something like that, I said. And he said, the Lord is speaking very clearly to me now. He said, I'm... And, I, you know, I, I really believe the Lord is saying that you're not going to be a, a postman forever. You're going to be a preacher. And that was the first time that, um, that I even, I think I was a little bit like the disciples at that moment. I chose to forget that. 
<laughs> at the time. You know, oh, I couldn't do that. But the thought that God was going to use me, the thought that God was going to use me, I ran home from Mount Pleasant to Penn Main Road. I ran home and I didn't stop. I was fitter in them days. <laughs> and I, was, I remember jumping. I jumped a couple of times. Saying, God's going to use me. God's going to use me. I was so excited. God is going to use me. I think more the emphasis was on me. God's going to use me. Of all people. But that's not all that John said. John gave me a scripture to meditate on and to think about. A, a life scripture. Or it's become a life scripture to me. Whenever I doubt my calling, whenever I get to that point where I'm thinking, oh, this is, I can't do this. Who do I think I am here? You know, God always reminds me of this scripture in John 15. John, James said, remember this, Lee. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And wow. How grateful I was. That gratitude. And I know there are others who can share that same, who, who, who have had a similar experience too. And there are others that the Lord is speaking to as well. And you will hear that. And you will know that the Lord is going to use you. But they were filled with gratitude because they didn't choose him. See, in, back in the day, a disciple, a prospective disciple, would, would see a rabbi rolling into town, these itinerant rabbis that, that were a thing in those days, and, um, and he would decide um, whether um, he would um, want to become a disciple in the first place. But he would approach the rabbi then, sit at his feet, hear the teachings, and the rabbi would decide whether that prospective disciple had what it takes to be one of his followers. And Jesus, if you remember, the, 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 the men are fishing on Gal at Galilee, and, and what does Jesus come along? He comes along and he says, follow me. He sees Matthew, the tax collector, Levi, writer of this gospel, in his tax collecting booth, the least person that anyone would think that God would use and call to follow him. And yet he says, Matthew, follow me. Follow me. And he says, follow me to us. He said it to some of us, but we're being really disobedient, I think, sometimes. You know, you know who you are. I don't know who you are, but, but I know in a gathering as small as, small as we are, but there's enough people that it could, tells me, I know that there are people in you that are not walking in that calling that God has called them to, for whatever reason. For whatever reason. But follow him. Take the opportunity. Step out in faith. Trust him. They were filled with gratitude and they came forward. They came forward because they were those who were grateful. They came out of the crowd and they came to Jesus. They came out of the crowd and they came to Jesus. Gratitude is such a wonderful motivation. It beats fear hands down. Fear will motivate to a certain extent. And don't, doesn't the church know that too well? Throughout history, if you know church history, it's not always been a pretty picture. You see, they've forgotten what it was to be grateful. Gratitude will motivate a person to give their lives. That thankfulness, that attitude of thanks and gratefulness will motivate a person to, to climb a mountain and sit at the feet of Jesus. The difference between fear and gratitude. People often say when you come to Jesus, it's the fear that keeps you in. It's the fear that will keep you living the life and walking the right way and behaving right and saying the right things. I used to think that, but oh boy, fear is a slave master, isn't it? Fear is the law that says you must or else. Tick this box, dot this I, cross this T. 
It was only when I realized that gratitude is the motivation that God is looking for in his people. But it just changed my whole understanding of what it means to live for him and to serve him. You see, fear, it got to the point for me when I just rebelled against it. Because that's what fear does. Because we're not meant to be slaves of fear. We're meant to be those who are free. Free to choose. Free to love. Free to follow. Jesus has set you free. For when the Son of Man sets you free, you are free indeed. It's a beautiful... I'm not going to get through my whole, what I've said, so I'm just going to share something with you. A beautiful picture. See, there are those in the church, general, generally. There was a generation during uh, the, the, uh, the history of the church, and still is in many ways, that says if you give a person enough grace, too much grace, they'll just squander it, they'll take it for granted, they live anyhow, any way they like. Give them too much freedom and, and that's what you'll get. So you've got to taper it in. You've got to somehow, be, uh, you've got to somehow um, um, keep them down with a little bit of the law as well. And as evangelicals, we've been good at that. Yes, come to Jesus just as you are. But we'll be tired you if you think you're going to stay that way. <laughs> that wasn't quite Billy Graham's... Um, way of saying it, but that's kind of how they, as, as evangelicals, we've, we've managed to interpret it. Come to Jesus just as you are, by grace, through faith, and work like Billio to stay there. Does that sound like good news to you? Because I tell you what, if that's the gospel, then I've lost already, and I will not make it. I may as well just take my mic off, go out that door, sit down on the settee, and just go and do whatever I want, because I know I'll never make it if it's up to me. You see, fear does that. It drives you. It pushes you. It puts a chain around you, and it drags you along. But gratitude is so different. Grace is the essence of gratitude, and gratitude comes from grace. When you've been shown grace, when you've been shown mercy, when you've been shown the love that nobody else has ever showed you before or can show you in the way that you've received it from Jesus, then oh, it changes everything. It just changes everything. The gospel is good news for a reason. For a reason. It means it, because it has no strings attached to it. It has no weights that push you down and drags you along. The gospel is good news. Abraham Lincoln, um, he's known for, um, for his um, opposition to the slave trade during his day. And um, but one day, um, as the slave market was still a thing in his day, and uh, much to his, his, his grievance, he was grieved by it. But he decided, um, when presidents seemed to be able to do this kind of thing, to take a walk down where a slave market was, uh, was in place was happening. And, um, and as he went to the, to the main square, um, there were a, a line of about three or four um, um, black African slaves. And uh, there was a young girl. People were bidding on, and she was the last one to be, to be bought. And uh, like as, a, as if she was a, 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 an object, a possession, which is how they were seen. And, um, and people are beginning to bid and, be, and, and some are bidding um, one figure, or some are bidding another figure, and she's, a, and she's just there, just, just an object for them to purchase and, to, and to, um, to barter over. But Abraham Lincoln decides that he's going to buy this slave, and he puts his hand up, he says, I'll buy her. I'll buy this slave. And everybody's, oh, well done, Mr. President. Well done, you know. He's, gonna, he's got a he's, bought one of his own slaves. And as, he, um, as they release the slave girl to follow him, I'm just, try, I'm just trying to remember, so I do apologize if I'm stuttering and whatever, just trying to remember how it goes. And as that slave girl um, follows him home, um, he turns around, out of the eyes of everybody, turns around and he says, my dear, you are free. And she doesn't move. She's, 
She's paralyzed. She's like, with a puzzled look, what do you mean, free? And he says, you are free. She says, free. She says, you're free. And she says, I'm free to say what I want. You're free to say whatever you want. Free to do what I want. She says, you're free to do whatever you want. And she says, free to go where I want. He goes, you're free to go wherever you want. Free means free. And she stops. And she thinks about it. And she looks at him and says, then I think I'll go with you. She recognized that freedom doesn't always mean what we think it means. Freedom that the world gives will just take us back into slavery. The only one who can truly set us free is the one who's purchased us by his blood. That's where true freedom is. She served him for the rest of her life. Isn't that amazing? She chose it because she recognized that this was a good man. It wasn't fear that motivated her. It was gratitude to the one who bought her. Out of the whole multitude, his disciples came to him. Out of the whole multitude. Out of the whole flock, if you like. It was those few sheep that recognized that they wanted to be where he was. Like sheep following the voice of their shepherd or the penguins. I I was reminded of this. This is what I mean when God brings it all together. Like sheep following the voice of their shepherd, they leave the crowd and follow him up the mountain. Remember Jesus says, where I am, my servant also will be. No questions asked. This this is how it is. Where I am, my servant, the one who follows me, who's my disciple, will be where I am. I wouldn't want to be anywhere that he's not, would you? In Psalm 84 that I read to you earlier on, it says, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to live in the luxury of the tents of the wicked. This is David, King David saying this, who knows what it is to have fallen badly, who knows what it is to have fallen from grace, we say. Oh, by the way, you can never fall from grace. Because grace is something that's there to catch you when you fall from the law, when you fall from the tyranny of fear. You fall into grace when you fall from the law. Isn't that amazing? Think about that. It's just a little, throw that one out to you. David knows what it is to fall hard, but he also knows what it is to be restored, to be renewed, to be redeemed by God. And this is his heart. He's pouring out his heart. He's saying, Lord, I'd rather be a a doorkeeper. I'd rather stand there scrubbing the temple floor, because that's what a doorkeeper would have done. I'd rather be in the foyer. (laughs) If it was today, we have foyers and churches, but I'd rather stand on the door and let watch everybody else walk in to worship you and to walk into that holy place than be out there doing my own thing. I'd rather be where you are than even living in the greatest luxury that this world can offer. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I heard one preacher say it like this. I think it was Steve Brown from Pensacola. He said, I'd rather be in, no, it wasn't, it was Paul Washer. I'd rather be in hell with Jesus than in heaven without him. Are you that right? <laughs> Put it in perspective. But if hell was an option and Jesus was there, then I'd rather be there than in heaven without his presence, without him. Could I be content to spend eternity in a heaven without Jesus? His disciples came to him from out of the crowd. 
because they could not bear to be apart from him. He walked out. They walked after him. They came out of the crowd of popular opinion. They came out of the crowd of fashion victims trying to get one up on each other. They came out of the crowd of people pleasers too afraid to stand up and be counted. They came out of the crowd of the gossip mongers. The crowd can represent anything that attracts your attention to things that do not matter and distracts you from the one who matters most. His disciples came to him, and his disciples came to him. Disciples are ones who learn. They learn, and that's why they come. They come to learn from him, to learn his ways, to be like him. A disciple is not above his teacher, Jesus says, nor a student above his master, but when he's fully trained, he will be like him. And we are called to be like Christ, to know him. A disciple is one who learns that he began to teach them, saying, and he gives the beatitudes, which we'll go through uh, in, in due time. He began to teach them. The Greek word for disciple is mathetes, and the Hebrew is talmudim, which means follower, on the one hand, and one who learns from the other on the other hand. When a rabbi decided that someone had what it takes to be his disciple, he would begin to unfold to that student his teaching program, his curriculum, so that the disciple could see it and know the rabbi's way. The way. Jesus, remember? I hope this is sparking things in your mind, things that Jesus has said. I am the way and the truth and the life. This is the rabbi's way of life. And, it be, and that d- disciple could begin to emulate what he saw and heard. That set, it's that set of teachings and the way of life that the rabbi had, which he called his yoke. This is his yoke. Like the yoke that a farmer would put on a young cow or oxen to train it, to discipline it, to teach it, to learn, to plow in a straight line. And often the farmer would place that young ox with an older and more experienced oxen. And so the elder would train the younger in the way. You see, disciples are those who will make disciples. And that's what the Lord is looking for in his church too. That's what we want in our church, isn't it? Disciples who are able to make disciples. And for that, you need to sit at the feet of the master. You need to hear what the teacher is saying and understand what he is saying and spend time there, accumulating, taking in, um, breathing in the dust from his rabbi's feet. Sounds like a weird saying, doesn't it? But in Jesus' day, um, they didn't have roads like we have. They were dust tracks more often than not. And people wore sandals. And as the rabbi would walk on in front, the disciples would walk behind, following him, watching him, listening to him, imitating him. And as the rabbi walked, the dust would be flicking up from the rabbi's sandals. And the students who were close behind him would begin to get covered in the dust of their rabbi's feet. And it became a proverb. May you be, and a blessing, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi, because that would show that you are so near your teacher. You are so wanting to learn from him that even the dust from his feet was a blessing to you. It even began to be like a proverb amongst, um, um, uh, in the Jewish community, that that dust was like a, a metaphor for his teachings. May you be clothed, may you be covered in the teachings, in the dust of your rabbi, as you follow close behind him and walk with him. Jesus says to us, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, my curriculum, my set of teachings upon you and learn from me because I am lowly and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says, come to me. Come out of the crowd and come to me. He isn't 
coming to us. He's not at our beck and call. He's already come. And now it's our turn to come to him and to go where he is. He moves so we move. He stays so we stay. He speaks and we listen and we do whatever he tells us. And first and foremost, he says, come, follow me, draw near to me and stay in my presence. Those who draw near are the ones that he calls disciples, who take the time to walk with him and make the effort to follow him, to make the effort to ascend the mountain. Notice how the crowds are still down there on the plain because that mountain looked pretty steep probably. Only those who really wanted to be there, who really wanted to follow him, would brave that climb up that hill and sit at his feet. There is a yoke to put on. We're responsible for living out his words, for putting his teachings into practice. There is a work to do when we become disciples of Jesus. There is a burden to bear, Jesus says. But my burden is a light burden. It's not like the burden of the law. It's not like what you had before. Come to me. Because he's already borne that burden for us on the cross. You know, the religious mindset, um, you think that they have to work their way into God's good books to gain God's favor. You have to do certain things. People do really extreme things to prove that they're worthy to, be, to, um, to enter into the gates of heaven and to enter into God's presence and gain his favor. They do things like walking on their knees while flagellating themselves and making themselves bleed because there's something in them that says you're not good enough. They're trying to bear the, the, that whole burden on themselves. Multitudes of sincere believers are burning out, running around, trying their hardest to carry a burden that's already been born, and they're getting crushed beneath the weight of an impossible burden that they were never meant to carry in the first place. If anyone comes after me, Jesus says, let him take up his cross and follow me. Granted, but Jesus meant that's what you're to expect from the world. Be prepared for hardship. Be prepared for trials and difficulties because you're following me. Jesus is speaking of the discipline that will be involved, saying to self, say no to self and yes to God. But to atone for our own sins, that was already done 2,000 years ago on the cross. Jesus bore the burden of your cross. He died upon it. But before he breathed his last, he said these three words, Can anyone take the words out of my mouth? It is finished. It is finished means that you are free from carrying the impossible burden of having to work your way into God's acceptance. Not my quote somebody else's, but I wish I'd said it. You are accepted already. The king has made up his mind and his choice was you. The only burden God the Father places on us now is the joyful burden to simply believe in the one that he has sent. God's heart, God's purpose and his will today is for you to leave the crowd behind. So I think it was Casey Treat said, uh, if you want to fly with the eagles, you've got to stop hanging with the turkeys. It's a good one, isn't it? Leave the crowd behind. They're going to drag you down. They're going to keep you back from what God has prepared for you. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The disciples wanted to be where he was because the Lord, they knew this, the Lord is good and his love endures forever. And in his presence, there's fullness of joy. And in his right hand are blessings forevermore. Endless blessings. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else today other than where he is. There is no other place to go. There's no better place to be than to be standing in awe of our king, seated on his throne of glory, sitting at his feet and hearing the gracious words that come from his mouth. So as you go out to live and work, May the royal presence of the living God go with you. And to use that beautiful proverb, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. Amen.
into it. Father, we just bless you and praise you and thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for every day that we awake. Lord, for the breath in our lungs and the day, O oh Lord God, in which to do things, Father God, that we could never have done apart from your grace and strength and calling. Gracious Father, we pray that as we go out into this week, Lord, that you would give us the confidence, Lord God, in you to come out of the crowd. Give us that desire, that inclination to leave the, the, the madding crowd far behind so that we can sit at your feet and hear what comes from your mouth. Lord, we may sit in your presence. Father, we pray that um, those that we touch, those that we meet, Lord God, today and in the days to come, we'll be able to know what it means to know you. So God bless us, empower us, strengthen us to be those, O oh Lord God, who are not ashamed to walk closely behind you and show others that we are your disciples. Amen.